Councilor Reynolds. Here. Sorry about that. Councilor Flaherty. Here. Councilor Mackin. Here. Councilor Maglio. Here. All present. All right, terrific, thank you. Um, as uh, was suggested, it was my intention uh, to take these items that we have on tonight's agenda out of order. And uh, as it works out, that would be uh, appropriate since we are still waiting for uh, other folks to join us who are here uh, to address a uh, new business item 22017, authorization to enter into a tax increment financing agreement for the property located at 400 Wood Road or take up any action relative there too. So with that being said, uh, do we have any um, do we have any comments or um, regarding us taking that item and placing that third in our agenda this evening? All right, hearing none. Um, let's take care of a few pieces of business first. Housekeeping. Uh, that'll be the approval of minutes. Um, starting with January 25, 2022. Is there a motion to approve minutes of January 25, 2022, minutes of February 15th, 2022, and minutes of March 1st, 2022? Motion to approve minutes of January 25th, 2022, minutes of February 15th, 2022, and minutes of March 1st, 2022. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Okay. Thank you. Second by Councillor, <clears throat> excuse me, Mackin. All right, uh, again, for a roll call of a yes or no. So uh, Clerk Samino, if you would please provide a roll call. Councillor Reynolds. Aye. Councillor Flaherty. Aye. Councillor Mackin. Aye. And Councillor Maglia. Aye. Four in favor, zero opposed. Great, thank you very much. Um, we don't have any old business this evening to discuss, so we'll get into the new business. And I said, uh, we will start with item number 22018, Mayor, authorization to accept donations or take up any action relative thereto. So, um, the mayor's office, uh, if you would like to speak to this item first and set the table. Thank you, uh, Chairman Reynolds. Good evening, everybody. Uh, as was mentioned, this is a request for authorization for the use of Community Preservation Act funding in the amount of $450,000 for renovations to the park and street hockey rink located at 144 Wildwood Ave, adjacent to the Highland School. Uh, this was truly a collaborative effort uh, put forward by several individuals, including Jeffrey Osman, a friend of Nathan Beliga uh, and local community advocate, as well as our very own Councillor Mackin, Acting Recreation Director Chris Griffin, who's here with us this evening, uh, and with the support of Highlands Elementary School Principal Nancy Pelletier, uh, the Highlands Parent Teacher Organization, Braintree Youth Hockey, and residents of the Highlands community. What this application seeks to do is renovate and offer significant enhancement to the park, including providing a fenced in park grassy area that would be known as Nathan Beliga Park and uh, establish a fully handicap accessible street hockey rink that would be available for use uh, by the recreation department in summertime clinics and playground programs, continued use by the Highland School for physical education and kickball, as well as for youth use, excuse me, by a newly established Youth Street Hockey League. Uh, in addition to the actual physical uses for the property, it also presents a great opportunity to raise awareness for the Sarcoma Foundation in Nathan's memory. The $450,000 is split between two CPC buckets. It would be 200,000 coming from the Open Space and Recreation Program 
and 250,000 to come from the unreserved program. This uh, received unanimous favorable recommendation from the CPC at a meeting earlier this month. And here with us this evening to answer any questions, as I mentioned, uh, we have Chris Griffin and we also have Director Santucci Razi from Planning and Community Development. Uh, and with that, I would turn it over to the committee for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chief of Staff Tog. Uh, I'd like to ask members of the Ways and Means Committee for any of their comments or questions at this time. Who would like to go first? Council Flaherty, thank you. Hi, um, I think that I there, the original plan for this involved the playground as well. And I'm curious to know where that falls. If we're not gonna tackle it now, is there a plan to tackle that in the future? Um, Chairman Reynolds, I could take that if you will. Uh, okay, the chairman recognizes Councilor Mackin. Um, actually, Chris, do you want to take this? Yeah, certainly, uh, Councilor. Good evening. The chairman recognizes uh, interim park director, Chris. Good Nicholas. evening, Mr. Chairman, and through you to Good the evening. members. Um, so, Council Faraday, thank you um, for that question. Uh, yes, in the very early days of this project, um, there was, uh, you know, some some uh, discussion um, about the replacement of the, the Highlands, uh, the playground behind the Highland School as doing it all as, as one project. Um, but after discussions, um, you know, with with uh, with several stakeholders, it was decided um, that the, that the, the hockey rink, um, at least for the the for the time being, um, should be the focus. Um, we we recently, you know, we we have been over the past. 10 to 15 years been replacing playgrounds throughout town. Most recently, um, the uh, the park on Elmont Road, um, which was totally redone about two years ago in in, uh, in North slash East Braintree. Um, and of course, there's a, a relatively new, new playground um, within about less than a mile from the Highlands School, um, the Highlands Playground adjacent to the Braintree Community Arts Center, which is uh, one of, if not our largest uh, playground in town. Um, so the decision was taken um, to focus on the, the hockey rink itself. That being said, you know, down as we move down the road, uh, obviously the, the playground at Highlands um, will likely, you know, um, be certainly be a candidate for uh, for replacement, you know, in the in the in the near to mid future. Okay, thank you. Okay, actually, I, I do have a. I do have a correction to make. I do believe I had mentioned that this uh, topic of discussion was 2201A. Uh, I stand corrected that is 22019. Clerk Samino, if uh, you would recognize that and any of, uh, are we good to go yes, proceeding as is? We're all set. Thank, Thank you. you. Everyone understands. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, Mr. Griffin. Um, I'd like to ask if any of the members are, are actually, I turn the table back and, and recognize Council Flaherty, who was the originator of this question. Oh, well, um, I think I, I, I think I understand why the, the playground, there's, there's not a definitive plan to tackle that in the future, but there's a hope that we will tackle it in the future. And um, that's good to hear. Uh, I guess my question is, do we have a a precedent for the frequency with which this um, hockey park or is is used. What's its rate of use? Well, um, as of right now, it it it's it, it, just to call it a, a street hockey rink. Um, it's basically right now a, a a former tennis court with some hockey um, nets on it. Um, and it does get a great deal of use in the, in the, uh, you know, in the, the, the um, around the Highland school, the, um, the PE teacher uses it on a regular basis, uh, when they do outdoor, um, gym. Um, and, uh, we have a, our most popular playground program during the summer is, um, at the Highlands behind the Highland school. Um, so the, our counselors do, do utilize it. Um, but as I said, you know, as of right now, it is what is what is existing there is former tennis courts with some some hockey nets on it. This this uh, project would be to um, replace those with um, something to, that pretty much resembles a, a hockey rink with with boards, benches, 
um, and you know the court lined um, for street hockey. So we we do in, we would anticipate you know increased use both uh, by the school itself, um, our playground programs, um, uh, you know, use uh, by a by a potential street hockey league that would be an addition to our current youth sports offerings that we have in town. It's not a, it's not something that we currently have a league for, um, as well as um, uh, uh, what would best be described as pickup use um, when those three um, three activities um, aren't using the the the, the rink. Well, I used to play street hockey when I was a kid. So I, to me, this sounds like a super fun idea and I hope that it will bring the community together around a, a fun sport. Is there a plan for, is there really like a, a concrete plan to develop a street hockey league in Braintree? So what, as we move forward in this, our plan is to, you know, reach out to stakeholders to, um, to obviously to get something off the ground to help create a board. Obviously we want to reach out to Braintree Youth Hockey um, certainly any of the other um, people who've been involved with the youth sports leagues, the little leagues, uh, youth soccer, um, we can, we, we'd hope to put together, you know, a, um, a, um, a kind of a, um, a board to get such a league off the ground. Um, we've seen in other communities, Weymouth, um, you know, that, that these sort of, by, by placing this, you know, type of facility here, it creates a great deal of interest. And we would hope that we could, um, um, have something to, you know, offer the community in a, a league that, you know, we're always looking to add youth sports offerings. We, uh, this past year, we were happy to see the start of the Braintree Youth Field Hockey, which we hadn't had in the past, um, which just started last year. So we hope that this is, would be the next uh, youth league that uh, is coming down the pipeline. All right, well, I'll have to dust off my rollerblades. You're very <laughs> welcome. <laughs> We'd be glad yeah. to have you there. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank, Thank you, Council. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Uh, I want to recognize Councilor Mackin, who has his hand raised. Council Mackin. Um, thank you, Chairman Reynolds. Um, I would just like to, you know, say as one of the people who was kind of involved in this from the beginning, um, you know, a lot of a lot of work did go into this by a lot of different parties. Um, there would be you know, as far as questions of use, um, if you drive by this area now on a nice day, there are kids using it. Um, the Highland School does currently use it during gym class. So we would only expect use, to, um, use of it to increase a lot. And I was, again, very um, excited to be one of the people helping to bring this forward. It was a, truly a team effort and a lot of work has got into it. And um, we would really appreciate your support tonight. That's it. Thank you, Council Mackin. Do any other councilors have any additional questions or comments? I see that uh, Councilor Maglio has her hand raised. Councilor Maglio. I just have a comment. Um, I am excited to see this uh, uh, happen for the people in, for the young kids in the neighborhood. Um, I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great use of CPA funds. I just wanna bring up one comment for people maybe to think about um, that is less to do with this particular proposal and use of funds and more to do with the way that we go about um, making decisions. We received an email from someone that was saying, hey, why are you doing this and why not do that? And while <clears throat> I think it's great to hear from people, I also feel as though um, you don't not move forward on a good thing because somebody may think of something later to apply for, right? We had this great plan from all the people that Councillor Mackin mentioned. Um, it went through the process. It's, it's a great opportunity for kids to play. It's something the community wants that everything about it seems to be, is, is very positive and I absolutely support it. But what might, ha what might be helpful for people is to know is there a full amount of money that gets decided on within a certain amount of time so that if there are other people that are thinking of applying for uses to this, that people get their uh, applications in by January and then the decision is made in April or something like that so that there's a cycle and a process and it's a way to say, hey, if you have an idea, then go 
put a plan together and fill out an application and and apply. Okay, uh, Count, the chair recognizes Director Santucci Razi. Uh, if I may um, shed some light on that question um, through the chair. So um, we have, I, at the last meeting, I think we discussed um, the budget. Um, and when this project comes out, we'll be looking at uh, just under $5 million and then we'll get probably about another million dumped in um, to the fund. We do not have application deadlines. There's some communities um, and, and, and the reason, a reason a lot of them do this is because they are town meeting communities. So they offer two sort of rounds of community preservation funding requests because the only people that can say, yes, you can use the money is town meeting. And in, in, a, in a town form of government, town meeting typically happens in the spring and then again in the fall. So the application rounds typically coincide with getting in, getting to the CPC committee, doing the legwork and then being teed up to get on what they call the warrant for town meeting. Um, we have a city form of government, um, which works a little better and for in some cases, um, and we have the availability to go to the council twice a month um, and have these kinds of requests and also attend subcommittee meetings that meet on a regular basis. So there is no hard and fast deadline of you need to file by this date in order to get this money. Um, there's several people, um, that contact me uh, and we sort of keep a list and that appears on every uh, community preservation meetings agenda. So if anybody's interested, like, hey, who's gonna be coming forward with CPC or who's who's reached out to Melissa, uh, that is on the agenda uh, and, it's, and it's updated every single month and that information and updates to those quote pending, um, not pending, but potential projects, I should say, uh, are discussed with the CPC. So anybody who reaches out to any counselors or any other departments here in town that have any questions, this is essentially how this one started. I believe there was some contact to Chris or, or Councilor Mackin, and then the gentleman Jeff sort of um, reached out to me and then uh, Councilor Mackin and Chris kind of jumped in to help him um, to get this over the finish line. So there is the answer, the short answer is there is no hard and fast deadline. It's on a rolling basis and applications are accepted uh, at any time uh, when they're ready. Um, I, I don't recommend um, going to hard and fast deadlines. Um, what that sort of does is it, it it, it, we don't have a, let me go back a little bit. We don't have, a, we got enough money and we don't have like all these applications that we're getting to the point of vetting them against each other where, where it comes really competitive. Okay. Um, in some communities that, that may happen. Um, but we've got a decent amount of money. Um, we've really been ramping up the program over the last year and a half or so and spending a decent amount of money. And we, we still have plenty uh, in, the, in the pot, I should say. Um, but if there's questions around that or if a resident has a question, I got an email last week from someone else um, asking about a, a potential use of funds and some things are eligible, some aren't. And the ones that are eligible, the dialogue continues and most of them turn into an application. Thank you, really helpful. <laughs> Anything further, Councilor Maglia? Nothing from me, no Nothing. thanks. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I do appreciate that last, I'm sorry, what was, was there a, a motion? <laughs> Julia, I was pointing toward Julia, she had. I'm sorry, I missed that. Councilor Flaherty, please. Uh, you are on mute. So can you unmute Councilor Flaherty? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Go. So I just, Councilor Maglio um, brought up a good point and um, this hockey skate park will be an excellent idea and I'm happy to support it. Um, but my question generally about CPC is, do we have an overarching plan in this town for how we want to spend that money or do we kind of just take one resident's idea at a time and evaluate each one on its own merits and then move forward to the next one um, it seems like it's really hard for me to see how how things are prioritized right 
Um, if if uh, I'll wait to be recognized, but I can take that question. Yes, please. Chair thank recognizes you. the director. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. So there was a CPC plan done um, when it was first adopted. Actually, Jen Goldson did it, who was our master plan um, oh. consultant. Um, and um, I have a lot of ideas um, and, and things that I, I'm implementing little by little with CPC. As you all know, um, we have a um, new CPC manager, um, Elizabeth Manning, who you all got to meet last month. Um, and one of the things um, on the list of things to do is to revisit that plan and to think about updating it um, and, and sort of the next steps. Uh, no deadlines really yet. We're, we're really focused on the master plan here. Um, which is something that's extremely important, um, but also updating the uh, CPC plan. I can dig out the old plan uh, if anybody's interested in seeing it. It actually might be up on the website, um, but CPC plans have gone, come full circle since that was first written. So um, we do have one. It's very old, um, and my goal is to update that. I would say within the next two years. And I know that sounds like a long time, but I'm just trying to be um, realistic. Okay, well, I didn't know about that plan. So that is awesome. And if it's um, not on the website, I would love to see it posted there. Even if it is mm -hmm. really old, I would take a look at that. Yeah, I think I can share it with uh, Clerk Samino and she can distribute it uh, to those uh, or the full council um, as needed. All right, that's really all I have, thanks. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Thank you, Director Santucci Razi. Um, as I would have to say that I am also in full support of this project, uh, providing approval for the expenditures. Uh, like Council Flaherty, uh, I grew up playing street hockey. Uh, I think uh, that my uh, role models are a little bit older than yours. Bobby Orr and Phil Esposito back in the day. Uh, so I, I fully support this. I think it's a great use for the youth of Braintree, particularly. Um, it can be, from what I understand, a, uh, a cross use um, as well. Did I read somewhere in some of the documentation that there was a pickleball court uh, that would be painted on the surface as, as well? Or am I confusing that with another matter? I'm uh, Director Santucci. Um, there is not pickleball that it's part of this. Uh, the pickleball was, um, uh, I believe it was approved in September of last year. It's actually under construction right now. In the same location? No, that's it, Hollis. That one, I yes, I'm very familiar with that. Yep. Okay, thank you. So uh, my apologies, I'm not quite sure where I saw that reference, but thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I would say that I do like, uh, I am interested in the follow-up of a plan, if you will, of how this uh, available funds to the community uh, can be programmed um, a bit more um, in conjunction with uh, how the town spends its money in the various categories that are available in CPC or CPA funding. Uh, as, in, uh, as Director Santucci uh, Rossi had uh, referred that in a master plan, there are categories of the master plan that cleanly align with the categories that are available for spending within the CPA funding. So there is, there is there are synergies there that I think can work very well together, in particular in the atmosphere that uh, the town of Braintree finds itself presently, uh, as other communities may as well, um, of funding being tight. Um, Braintree does value its recreation. It does value its open space. It does value its historic preservation. Um, so I think there may be some merit for this discussion um, as Councillor Maglio brought up uh, and as Councillor Flaherty emphasized as well uh, for us to have discussions about how that may work in the future and how we might be able to leverage some of the past uh, management, uh, program management, as uh, Director Santucci Razi referred to. So that is the extent of my comments. So with this, I'm going to ask if there's any additional questions or comments before I ask for a motion. 
Hearing none. Okay. Um, do we have a motion to support the expenditure of $200,000 from the CPA recreation bucket and $250,000 from the general use bucket of the CPA funding for the project located at Highland School for the construction of a street hockey rink. Uh, for favorable recommendation to the full council, motion that the town of Braintree be and hereby is authorized in accordance with section 53A of chapter 44 of the Massachusetts general laws to accept the following gift. No, sorry. Nope, that's the wrong one. Sorry. So, so, so sorry. Here's the right one. Okay, for favorable recommendation to the full council that in a motion that in accordance with the provisions of chapter 44B of the general laws and with the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee, the appropriation of $200,000 from the CPA Open Space Recreation Fund and $250,000 from the unreserved fund for the Nathan Buliga Park and Street Hockey Rink, Assessor's Map 1093, Plot 01, conditional on the funds expended under the direction of the Community Preservation Committee and the Director of Planning and Community Development. Thank you. Is there a second to that motion? Second. I have a second from Council Maglio. Clerk Semino, a roll call, please. Councilor Reynolds? Aye. Councilor Flaherty? Aye. Councilor Mackin? Aye. Councilor Maglia. Aye. It's <clears throat> four in favor, zero opposed. Okay, that is unanimous. Uh, the motion passes. Thank you. Okay, moving along. I know, uh, I'm sorry, Stank. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you very much, Director <laughs> Santucci Rossi. I appreciate your, your being here this afternoon. Yes, evening. and I, I just want to excuse myself. I don't want anyone to think I'm rude. I just need to prepare for uh, a master plan steering committee uh, meeting tonight. Thank you. We'll Have see a good you there. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Um, do we have all the required attendees uh, from the mayor's office for item 22018 authorization to accept donations? We do, Chairman Reynolds, um, if the committee is comfortable proceeding without the representative from the Braintree Art Association, uh, myself and Director Spellman are happy to present and answer any questions with regards to this item. Okay. All right. Well, what I'll do then, um, I would like to give that opportunity to that representative to attend. So with that, I'm going to Take up motion 22017, Mayor, authorization to enter into tax increment financing agreement for the property located at 400 Wood Road or take up any action relative thereto. Okay, so um, Chief of Staff Todd, would you please set the table for us? Certainly, thank you, um, Chairman Reynolds. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce a couple uh, individuals that we have here with us this evening. Uh, in addition, as I mentioned, Director Spellman is here. We have Margaret LaForest from the Massachusetts Office of Business Development. Uh, folks might remember Margaret from the presentation she offered to the full council about the work her office does and the various incentives available through that division. We also have with us tonight Brandon Pyers and Carl Nerlich from Deloitte. They are here on behalf of the potential tenant for the property located at 400 Wood Road, uh, and they are joining us from Deloitte. Uh, this is the team that has been working over the course of the last several months to attempt to negotiate and reach agreement on a tax increment financing uh, agreement for the property that would enable their client to move forward uh, and sign a lease and occupy this property to relocate their existing life science operations into Braintree. Um, I want to start and just, just to note, I think as folks might remember from Margaret's presentation, not uncommon for projects such as this to proceed in large part under a confidential name. Uh, and at this point, uh, we are still referring to this as Project Revere. It doesn't, Revere doesn't really stand for anything. It's just a random name that was picked. Um, 
but we are hopeful and anticipate being able to disclose the name of the tenant to the committee when we meet next week on Tuesday. Uh, some of the reason for that is there are certain internal notifications that the board that the company has to make before they can publicly announce uh, the relocation. Uh, but what we have shared about the company and what I, I can reiterate is that they are a privately held leading biomedical company uh, that focuses its expertise in regenerative medicine to develop and commercialize novel biologic devices for a variety of soft tissue repair and regeneration applications. And in a moment, I'll turn it over to Brandon and his team to offer a little bit more detail and insight into who this tenant is. Uh, but before I do that, I wanna share a little bit about the history of the property for folks that may not be as familiar. Uh, the site was the former home of Hamanetics, uh, located at Wood Road, uh, and has been vacant for several years now. In late 2019, early 2020, the property was purchased by Hilco Redevelopment Partners, and working with the mayor's office and identifying a value in attracting life science and biotech use, not just to Braintree, but to this area in particular, uh, Hilco committed to uh, enhancing and renovating the property to serve that goal. They've done a significant amount of renovation to the site. If anybody has been by it, you'll see uh, they, they made some additions to improve the entrance. They have um, upgraded the facade. They've added architectural features to modernize the building. They've repaved parking and upgraded the landscaping as well as other modifications to the property, all of which have gone through the planning board and through the building department to really focus on attracting this type of tenant to the property. So Project Revere is not the first uh, interest that we've gotten with regards to the site, but it is the project that we have uh, gotten to or about are about to cross the finish line with. Uh, and that's something that's really exciting. And I think, you know, Margaret can certainly speak more to it, but when you're talking about life science, we're really looking to establish uh, Braintree, given all of the benefits it has to offer uh, as a life science hub. And when you bring one, there are certainly going to be more to follow. So um, by way of background on the site, it's a little over 14 acres of land. The building is about 153,600 square feet. It was built in around 1975 and its current assessed value is 13 million 53 100,600 uh, broken out by building value, yard value, and land value. Uh, in 2022, the anticipated taxes on the site are just over 285,000, seeing a slight growth over 2020 and 2021. Also recognizing because the building has sat vacant, there were some abatements afforded to the property in the prior years. So, with that, I think it makes sense, uh, Mr. Chair, with your permission, I would turn it over to Brandon and Carl to talk a little bit about uh, their client and what attracted them to Braintree and kind of how this process has moved forward. Sure. Thank you. I appreciate that. And certainly the chair recognizes whomever uh, between Mr. Pyers and Mr. Nerlich who would like to speak first. Thank you. Thank you, Council Reynolds, and, and thank you to, to the rest of the councilors on the call. Uh, we very much appreciate your consideration and the time you're taking to learn a little bit more about our client. And um, we've been thoroughly impressed by all, all the collaboration we've had with the city of Braintree thus far. So um, thank you once again for, for hearing us out. And I'd love to provide some additional information here. And, and I'll just start with a high level and please feel free to uh, ask any comments along the way that you may have, or if there's something you would like to hear a little bit more detail on. Uh, both Carl and I are happy to backfill any of the information. We're going to keep it high level and, and relatively um, relatively uh, general at this point in time, um, just for the sake of our company's, our company's confidentiality, but certainly happy to provide and follow up with any additional information that would be helpful to you. First and foremost, the company is a global medical device manufacturer. They are headquartered on the East Coast of the United States. Uh, as Nicole said, they are largely based in regenerative medicine. That regenerative med medicine is largely focused in regenerative skin, neurosurgery, and reconstructive and general surgery. So they make the, a lot of the medical device applications that go into patients post-surgery, particularly those patients 
that have severe skin or burn wounds. So the company was the, one of the largest artificial, uh, artificial skin manufacturers and one of the first to actually use that tissue um, to treat severe burns and other skin wounds. So a little bit of groundbreaking science on this company's side. And as such, they've expanded in a lot of the locations that you would expect, particularly within the United States. Um, if there's a biotechnology hub out there within the US, they generally have a presence there. So California, New Jersey, et cetera, in addition to Massachusetts. Across their footprint, globally, the company will employ 3,700 people. Roughly 2,200 of those are employed within the United States. Not only do they have a significant United States presence, but they also have three locations currently in Massachusetts. So when we think of a competitive environment, we were not just looking globally, not just looking nationally, but also trying to see if there was any additional synergy or value that could be derived by partnering, expanding, or leveraging some of the other real estate options that exist within the Commonwealth. Um, predominantly, this operation will be, except for a very, very limited office and warehousing use, this operation is going to be biotechnology life science manufacturing. That process currently employs uh, roughly 127 people directly involved in this process. Of those, plus or minus 80 of those are direct employees with 4950 contractors that really help just smooth out some of the ebbs and flows within the production cycle. There is a temp to perm status for some of those people that they're bringing on board. And as part of that, they're looking to onboard post move. Uh, roughly 25 new jobs into this facility. The reason for the expansion, as you can imagine, is there's increased demand within the marketplace for their product. As such, they're modernizing their equipment, modernizing their facility, and looking to bring on some additional bodies to help achieve some of those gains that they need from a production capacity perspective. So this site um, is something that was certainly attractive to us. Um, as we're looking at this, when you think of a project of this size and complexity, uh, there's usually a number of factors that a company is going to look at when they're making these types of evaluations. First is going to be really understanding, is there a deep labor pool that can accommodate the workforce needs that the company has? We know that Massachusetts is a very well-known quantity. We feel very comfortable with that. In addition to that, does the community you're located again have a life science industry presence? Obviously, we know that Boston, and, and I'm sure Margaret will reinforce this later, is really the hub of the life science universe. So from that perspective, there certainly is a lot of draw, both from a talent perspective and a technology perspective that we feel is accessible. Plus, we're also very excited about what we've seen in some recent gains in the Braintree area um, that really shows that cluster expanding into the, into the town and, and how vital that can be for the future growth of the company and how the company can not only benefit from that, but also contribute to that over the long run, being part of that really integrated industrial cluster. Um, in addition, cost and availability of labor is huge, as well as the actual availability of leasable, suitable real estate. Um, if you have been watching home prices and, and seeing how quickly houses are going on the market, the same thing is happening in the commercial real estate industry. The market is hot and it is competitive, especially in the life science space. So the ability to find a site that was in the condition and the usability of 400 Wood Road certainly was a, a huge benefit that attracted our client to the city of Braintree. And last and not least, um, you know, having a supportive and, and business friendly local government to partner with. We're very comfortable with the folks at the Commonwealth um, and, and we were excited about the prospect of working more deeply with you and building these relationships initially on behalf of our client and then having our, our client set down their roots here and be productive members of the local business community for 15, 20, 30, 40 years. So um, from a high level, I hope that that's helpful to you. Um, oh, I can provide some insight in the timeline as well. Um, we're looking to make a decision relatively imminently. This is, this is a key part of the economics of the transaction. So it is, is certainly a material factor in the overall analysis as we move forward. There are some agreements in place with the landlord from an option basis, but there is no final lease signed. Um, we anticipate construction on the property if we were to move forward to begin in Q4 2022, and then having the certificate of occupancy roughly a year later. So the build out on this site would take probably a year, given our best guess. And that includes everything from fit out to equipment installation and validation that's going to be necessary. The interior of this building will be a, a clean room environment. So that really drives timeline and cost in order to get some the folks in there in order to not only build it out, but also to certify it. So um, there, there's a lot going on here. It's, it's a fairly tight timeline, 
but uh, we feel like it's achievable given where we currently are at. So with that, Councilor Reynolds, I'll turn it back to you and the rest of the members for, for any comments or questions. Thank you, Mr. Pyers. Appreciate that. Uh, just a quick comment before I put questions out, uh, ask questions of uh, fellow counselors. Um, so I would agree that Braintree, I feel, offers tremendous value uh, to the life science industry. I have been involved in a number of years myself and in the prior administration working with life sciences companies in trying to make a home here in Braintree. We do have one uh, up on Messina Drive that uh, we were able to work with them and provide them uh, with incentives uh, to expand their operations. Uh, you may know them as Zimmer Biomed. Um, uh, and that there are a few other smaller um, types of, shall we say, businesses that are in the eco cycle of life sciences that are looking at Braintree or have actually found some space here. So I fully, fully support uh, the objective of your client and agree 100% that Braintree offers very unique um, attributes to support this type of a in an industry. Um, and it's my understanding from your uh, presentation that uh, this is not a purchase of Wood Road by your client, but rather a lease. Okay, thank you. Um, there will be some questions that I have later, but I'm going to give the opportunity uh, to the counselor, to my fellow counselors to ask their questions first. Um, the, uh, uh, the TIF is, a, is also a very uh, valuable tool for communities like Branchy to draw businesses like this. I'm a firm believer, having been in the financial business myself, that uh, investment, understanding that it takes investment in order to get a return on, um, on your efforts. And this certainly would be an investment on Branchy's part. Um, as I said earlier, uh, this is a, a great opportunity. However, uh, I do have a pause for questions. Um, and I will hold those questions, uh, when, uh, but first I'd like to have my fellow counselors ask some of the questions and concerns or comments they themselves may have. So who would like to start first amongst the counselors? Chairman so Reynolds, a if, I, if I may, um, I have a, a, a second kind of component of the overview that relates specifically to the TIF and the terms of the agreement that we've reached between the parties. Uh, so I would leave it to you if perhaps you want to allow for questions about the operations and then we can move into the TIF terms or I can do that. Uh, I can provide that information and then we can take all questions, uh, whatever is your preference. Well, I think I'll take you up on the recommendation that why don't we first hear from you on the conditions of the TIF. Certainly. Um, so moving on to kind of the nuts and bolts of what we've been talking about. Uh, as, as the committee and the council was informed, there's a significant uh, financial investment that's going to be going into the property, estimated to be about $35 million for construction, renovation, and other development costs, as well as $16 million for machinery, equipment, furniture, and fixtures. Uh, that plus the relocation of the existing workforce of approximately 125 employees, as well as the creation of 25 new jobs specific to this location, are all factors that played into uh, the determination of what would be appropriate uh, from a TIF standpoint. So as folks remember, there are certain kind of minimum requirements that a TIF must achieve. Uh, the term has to be at least five years, but cannot be more than 20. Uh, and, and I'll let Margaret kind of explain this in a little more detail, but I do just want to note that throughout the duration of the TIF, the tenant continues to pay the full tax rate on the base value of the property, where the incentive or exemption comes in is on the incremental annual increase assessed on the site, and that is the direct result of the contributions and enhancements made uh, through the user. And the value of that exemption can range anywhere from a minimum of 5% to a full 100% over the identified term. And so what we've done for purposes of this project and this property, uh, considering that uh, the client is going to utilize about 100 square feet of the space within the property and the financial and job 
uh, contributions it's going to make to the site. Uh, we have set a TIF term of 15 years with an incentive value of 25%. So what that means is for 15 years, the tenant would uh, continue to pay the base value of the taxes due on the property and would effectively receive a 25% discount on only the annual or incremental growth on the value of the site. And so some of the key terms that are included in the agreement, which we'll be sharing uh, hopefully before our next meeting, is that by signing the agreement and in order for the company to receive the benefit offered through the TIF, there are certain commitments that have to be made. The company has to make the investment that I talked about of 35 million and 16 million on the site. And they have to relocate the workforce and add the jobs uh, that we've talked about. They've also committed to using uh, commercially reasonable efforts to hire from the Braintree area when increasing its workforce and using contractors for any of the work on the site that may in turn use workers from the Braintree area. So really focusing the value of this agreement locally to our community through new jobs and also through work as the build out begins and continues. If the tenant fails to meet any of those obligations or commitments, then there's a protocol in place for the town to proceed with decertification of the, pro of the incentive, meaning that the TIF would no longer be applicable to the property. So they are held responsible for meeting all of these obligations for the duration of the agreement. Um, so, uh, you know, I would note, as, as we've said before, that this is a, a standard incentive available uh, to companies such as this one looking to relocate or reestablish their operations. Uh, and it's something that always involves uh, Margaret's office, uh, Margaret, if it's in our area. Uh, and so with your permission, I would turn it over to uh, Margaret to offer a little bit more by way of background on the TIF and the process and how ours kind of plays into the whole. Hard, pardon me there, Margaret. <laughs> the chair recognizes Margaret LaForest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I think that Brandon and Nicole really just gave you a great overview. And my job here is to support the municipality through the process, as well as supporting the company through this process. Um, you talked about the TIF terms and the compliance of those terms. That is something that is monitored through the Economic Assistance Coordinating Council in the Mass Office of Business Development. So each year, the company will be required to report how many, how many uh, personnel are at that Wood Road location and on the capital expenditures um, expended at that location. And that is information provided to the municipality. You get a login and you know, can, can monitor that information as well. Um, as we talked about like, you know, life science projects, it is often um, that we start working these under code name. That's a very common practice um, as sometimes it's the science that needs to be um, you know, kind of kept kept at bay, or sometimes in this situation is a you know effects of existing personnel that they are trying to uh, be sensitive to. So uh, we've worked with Deloitte as a consultant on many of these co large codename life science projects. As I've mentioned on that prior presentation, we've had a few really good sniffs at Wood Road trying to bring a life science tenant. We've heard from Agricoros the interest that your community has in a life science tenant, um, but that they haven't materialized. So it's really great to see um, that your community is open. I think we've, we've really displayed um, the responsiveness of Braintree as each time we bring a company, uh, company forward to you. So it's been really great for me um, to be working with your team. There is a lot of back and forth that happens. Um, to prepare to bring this information to you. Our legal counsel will review the TIF document. And this is something typically the municipality's chief executive negotiates through, and, and Nicole's been uh, leading, leading this project with us. And um, the HD legal counsel is going to go through and edit that document to prepare to come to you ready to go. So you won't have the opportunity 
you know, to change happy to glad into kind of make textual edits. These are, uh, you know, documents, it's a lot of back end review, uh, making sure things are in compliance with the statute. So uh, we are working on the, you know, through the, through the draft language at this point. I think um, the other thing that I thought was interesting about why life science companies, you know, we're seeing some conversion uh, in Quincy, they had some office space recently converted to lab. Nicole made a really good point about, or it might've been Brandon as well, about co-locating, about the clusters of the life science community. It's your proximity, right? There was uh, a few years ago, the Quincy Chamber had partnered with the city of Quincy and Braintree about the life science corridor, taking advantage of that red line, that access to the greater Boston talent and bring those life science companies down to the South shore. So it's really great to see um, this coming to fruition. I think um, you'll um, derive a great benefit. Your, your municipal utilities are also to be recognized here. Companies see what you have in Braintree. They see the value that that provides them uh, locating in your community. So I think you've had a, a location that's been long time vacant. And when we talk about these TIFs and when you put an incentive package together, when does it make sense to, to, to offer that? When does it make sense to help a project get over the finish line? when it's a blighted property, when it's a long vacant property, right? The market wasn't driving tenants on their own. And so here's a perfect opportunity for the municipality to say, you know, we want that life science tenant. We want it on that Woodward location. It was set up as a biomanufacturing. Massachusetts is the global leader hands down in the life science ecosystem. Companies are continuing to locate here and to continue to grow here. You see some of these large, large name life science companies you know, um, for example, a, a Moderna comes to mind, right? Moderna started in Norwood a few years ago. Nobody knew who, the, who they were. And they've done three major hundreds of millions of dollars investments and had tips on each one of those projects. So you look at kind of on the big scale and this, you know, is a $53 million investment. This is significant for, for Braintree for this uh, location. So I'm glad to answer any questions on the process or anything I can do for this, uh, for the council. And then I also wanna make sure too, that uh, I know some commit questions were submitted uh, to the Integra team, to Nicole, we've re been reviewing, uh, trying to, their, as they prepare those responses, but anybody on the council that would like some time one-on-one -on -one to go through this, you know, um, in helping you with your homework, I always welcome you uh, to contact me directly. Thank you, Margaret. You're welcome. Okay. Um, uh, oh. Chief of Staff Tob, I'm sorry, Ms. LaForest. You, you know, I just want to make sure too, the 15 years on the terms, it's very common that the terms that get set align with the lease terms. That's, that's how these are done, right? So it's why 15 years. So when you're looking at that, it doesn't have to be 15 years, but quite often when you say, why did we come up with 15 years? That's the, it, we typically see them match the lease terms. Tips are very common, like I said, in the, in the life science companies. And to your point about kind of coming to the terms of 25%, there's a lot of good back and forth negotiation. Our office does not get involved into what the municipal terms are. This is your local incentive. We just make sure that you're in compliance with the process. It, and that you've really put together a good deal. Um, we see them, you know, sometimes they're coming out of the gate the first couple of years with 100%, 90%, 80%, and kind of step down by 10%. You really see them structured uh, a variety of ways. You know, where is it? Oftentimes it's really hard for the company with the big capital outlay. The pain is up front when they're trying to get this project to happen. You know, they've, um, so just, you know, th things to keep in mind is uh, what happens behind the scenes on the homework that the staff does here, whether it's myself, whether it's Brandon, the, the consultants, and Nicole, we're really vetting a lot of this out um, to be able to bring it to you. All set? All set. All right, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Chief, of Taff, Chief of Staff Todd, is there anything additional you'd like to add before we begin questions from the counselors? So the only thing that I would note is I think we may have, have had an inadvertent disclosure of the company. And so I would ask the individuals on this, phone, on this meeting um, to please uh, maintain that as confidential. And I see that we have Fred Hansen with us this evening. Fred, I will call you after the meeting to discuss that. Um, 
uh, before anything goes to print, just so that we can maintain the integrity of the process and what we're what we're doing here. Um, and with that, uh, I also shared just some detail on the numbers uh, that we've worked. And also clarify, I think I may have said 100 square feet, it's 100,000 square feet of the property, just so that that's clear and we have no confusion on that. They're not op occupying a corner, it's actually a large majority of the site. Um, and based on some calculations that we have run using a, a spreadsheet or worksheet that the state provides, which we, we will share with the committee, um, the, the savings, uh, on the value of the TIF uh, with the 25% increment over the 15 years is estimated to be just over a million dollars. Uh, in that same time period, the 15 years, uh, the total taxes, tax revenue coming to the town in the same time period is estimated to be between nine and $10 million. And that's uh, split almost evenly between the base value of the taxes, which we will continue to collect year over year, uh, and the added value less the discount resulting from the, the tax incentive being provided. So with that, uh, happy to uh, myself along with the team with us tonight to field any questions the committee might have. Also understanding we have the questions that were provided. We are working on written responses. I think we've covered some of that this evening, but we'll still uh, follow up with the documentation. And then myself and Brandon and Carl will be at the meeting on Tuesday evening. And then when we meet in person prior to the full council on the 5th, we will also be joined by client representatives uh, who will be available to answer questions directly as well as Brandon, Carl, Margaret, and myself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, just to address your request um, for the um, uh, disclosure, certainly. Um, I will respect that and will hold that confidential and will not be shared. And Thank you. Uh, I think I speak uh, for my fellow counselors, but you know, I certainly will allow them to address that themselves. Um, okay. Uh, so first up, um, who would like to ask a question amongst our uh, council members this evening? Hands is uh, Councillor Flaherty. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Reynolds. Um, so I, I have plenty of questions for this, but for tonight, I'll start with um, asking if we can have some elaboration on the nature of the jobs that may be created for this. I understand there will be 25 of them, but of course, um, a facility like that will have a wide range of jobs, everything from research and development right on down to maintenance and um, custodial care. So um, what kind of jobs do you expect to be creating uh, locally? You're muted. That was the button I was looking for, Councilor. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so with a facility this size, uh, the predominant focus of this will not be R&D. R&D will be done in another facility. The primary focus of this facility and roughly 90 to 95% of the jobs that are going to be existing in this facility are going to be directly related to the manufacturing process. Everything from operating the actual machinery to quality and QA, QC controls. Uh, there will be a few folks who are going to be involved, obviously, and there will be some maintenance given the clean room environment. We're going to need people who are paying attention to this and making sure it's accessible. Um, and in addition to that, there's also going to be some folks who are gonna be directly involved in the management of the operations. Technically, they're gonna be managing a manufacturing operation, but they're gonna have a title that puts them a little bit higher than the average manufacturing worker. Uh, to give you some sense of comfort in what we're talking about here, the average wage of the facility is gonna be roughly 78 to $80,000. So these are very, very good, strong, well-paying jobs in an industry that's in insane demand right now. So to be able to build and grow upon this manufacturing workforce and life sciences, um, it is a great thing, specifically for the town, because the deeper penetration you can get, the more attractive it will be for the next life science project as well. I hope that helps. Oh, it does. Thank you. Um, let's see. So to me, when I look at 
$51 million. That's an enormous sum of money that you're looking to invest in the property. But can you give me, can you put that in context of the, uh, of the company's annual profits? What does that kind of uh, investment represent to the company? Well, the company is a global company, but certainly everything is run by the business unit. I'd be happy to follow up with independent breakdowns from the company's 10K report. That might be more helpful and instructive to you, give you a sense of one, not only how is the company investing, where are they investing, but also the financial solid, uh, the financial condition of the company, which is excellent. But when we think about life sciences, um, it's a relatively, I would say, not, not excessively high, but also not excessively low. It's kind of in that middle market range for about 100 people in the manufacturing industry. If you were to look further at some of the medical genomics manufacturing facilities that are going on, um, those are tailored single use facilities that are being built for a specific use. Margaret earlier mentioned Moderna. You know, you're going to be looking at hundreds of millions of dollars for that. In this particular instance, it's more of a medical device technology than a biologic. So that changes some of the investment levels of the facility itself, brings them down a little bit. Um, but this is certainly $53 million is a meaningful investment on behalf of the business unit that's making it. And with that, they're exercising the right amount of care and prudence and making sure that they're fulfilling their fiscal obligation uh, to their corporation by pursuing a cost-effective location. And I say cost-effective, which is in terms of not only what is the true cost, but what is the return on value that they're getting. So in this case, the value proposition of Braintree is having access to talent, labor, and all the great things that we talked about at the beginning of the call. That's balanced against what is a relatively high operating cost. So if we think about performing anything in Massachusetts or acquiring real estate in Massachusetts, those are costly propositions. So um, we certainly feel that there's benefit here and, and, and part of the benefit and part of the contribution here through the, through the tax income and financing program is gonna to be to even out those operating costs vis-a-vis -vis other locations around the country as well. So um, I think when we're looking at it, we're trying to think about what is the cost? Machinery costs, what machinery costs? There would be some efficiency from both a labor perspective and from a real property perspective. So. What is the construction? What is the what is the average lease rate? Those things would likely be cheaper in a majority of other locations that we're considering. Okay, and um, you know, you talk. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion of uh, how when you bring one life science facility to a location, that helps to secure additional life science facilities. Mm -hmm. And in in Braintree's experience, we had Hamanetics here. Um, for a period of 15 years and they had a TIF, I think. And then at the conclusion of the TIF, they left. So, and we didn't um, draw any additional life sciences to this town as a, as a result of their presence. Also, Flaherty, if I may, just, just yeah. to, I believe the uh, TIF was never fully executed um, and actually went into practice. Uh, the um, and, and this is information that I have recently just uh, researched uh, and have confirmed that that was not the case. My apologies for not providing that information earlier. Oh, that's okay. It, it, it doesn't really change the nature of my question, which mm -hmm. is we had hemanetics here regardless of the circumstances and it didn't draw additional life science uh, facilities to the town. So if this is going to be different this time, I'd like to know why. Through the chair. So just by, you know, further on the Haymanetics, that was originally approved as a five-year um, TIF, not a 15, just by way of background. Um, and then I would ask Margaret to share a little bit, since she is directly involved with the development and growth of this industry in Massachusetts, to share a little bit about perhaps what has changed from then to now. Sure, thanks so much. You know, I think um, clearly our research, our research university is being Boston based is significant for why Massachusetts leads globally in the life science industries. Um, as you talk about these clusters, we are seeing them, right? So we have the life science corridor from down the red line. We haven't seen as much of the growth there. The bio pike, they're calling it out in, in this big clusters growing in Worcester growing, you know, really been growing uh, in the Northern area, right? The Walthams, the water towns, um, up, up in that way, the Bedfords, uh, 
Massachusetts has invested much in Devons. The Devons area has been very successful with landing life science companies. So I think you're seeing it kind of, you know, it starts in Boston and then goes out from there. And so now we're seeing it come to the South Shore. It's about availability. Um, I think there's also some, in not the issue for Braintree, but um, other South Shore communities maybe have some water sewer infrastructure. Sometimes they're very needs. And uh, oftentimes the manufacturing process is very uh, utility intense. And hence that is why. Um, I think you've seen significant support from our industry groups. So Mass Bio and what they're doing and a lot of uh, their members, we hear from uh, the large companies or a lot of the equipment, the suppliers, the supply chain that they need are in the Commonwealth. And hence it makes sense to be co-located around that. And then also um, the Mass Life Science Center. So another opportunity uh, for Project Revere is that they can apply for, so there's, just to be clear, it's 150 jobs. So it's 125 being relocated and then 25 new. So we're looking at 150 on the total jobs coming to Braintree. So these are, um, and the Life Science Center offers a tax incentive program of $15,000 per job. So as new jobs are created in the industry, it's a competitive grant program um, that they can get tax credits for that job creation. And oftentimes we see that to say, it's a life science company, they come in with a local only tip tax incentive, and then they apply to the Mass Life Science Center and get some tax credits for that job, the job creation. So we've really developed a lot of programs. And in addition to the job, um, like the tax incentive is very, very popular. Um, there's capital programs, there's support of industry. Uh, the other thing we're seeing um, with like Quincy College being in your backyard, you'd be surprised, but the good manufacturing program at Quincy College is quite renowned. And it's um, oftentimes partnering with industry to create their curriculum. They do on-site training. So being that in that such proximity to that program, the we can talk to this company about bringing them on-site for that training. But um, students at MIT and at Harvard who are going into life sciences will come to Quincy College and take uh, the manufacturing processing classes. So as you look at the whole ecosystem in the Commonwealth where we're seeing the growth, you're right, it hasn't grown is the volume in the South Shore yet, but we're really seeing it, you know, just your neighbors to the North saying how they're seeing that conversion of the office space to the lab space. We're seeing that across the Commonwealth. And now we are seeing projects come to the South Shore. The, we had a, a large, large project and, um, it op that looked at Wood Road, significant in the hundreds of millions investment, would have been a very heavy user of your utilities, um, opted to go to North Carolina. So to the point about, Brandon's point about costing it out and using the tools, the incentive tools to uh, balance the economics here to let this company choose Braintree. And so we are, you know, um, we work with life science companies all of the time they look at different communities. Mass Bio, we've actually talked with uh, Mayor Kokoros um, about what is it, do we wanna talk about uh, the Mass Bio Ready communities, what the Braintree rating is in elevating that, right? So there's like the silver, bronze, platinum, what is it that you can do to prepare, to attract? So we've talked about how do we increase Braintree's Mass Bio Readiness rating so that you are drawing these companies in. Okay. Um, another question I had was, you know, we, I one of the things I learned from the presentation that was given today is that the state will receive information on a regular basis from um, the company about the investments in the land and the furnishings and so forth for the building. And um, I was curious to know if there are key metrics or um, or milestones that. Are, are being de developed around to keep the company on pace in order to ensure that the TIF continues. Yep, they'll build out their job creation schedule. I believe these are all going to, um, and Brandon, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, sometimes the companies structure their jobs. Okay, we're gonna add 150 jobs over 15 years. But these are all front-loaded jobs going to be up and running. They're relocating it over. So I believe yours are coming all at once. But oftentimes we'd say, we said we were going to hire, you know, it's right in the application. We said in the application that they'll provide us so that 
uh, that we work against on their compliance, right? So we said in year 2023, we're going to hire 50 jobs, 2024, 50 jobs. The next year, 50 jobs. Within those three years, we're going to complete 150 jobs. We're going to maintain those jobs. Um, so job count will be measured annually. And then also the capital expenditure. You've told us the incentive is being offered. Why? Because you're creating jobs in our community and you're making a significant capital investment, right? So those are the two that we measure against. You said you were doing this. The company made their commitment. Did the company meet the commitment? And so we monitor that. And then if it's, we need to bring, you know, uh, bring in into correction, you say, geez, they didn't spend what they said and they're taking advantage of the real estate relief. Um, then you, they, the TIF can be decertified, right? You didn't meet the benchmarks. Why should you be deriving benefit if you're not meeting the benchmarks? And hence, that's why we have that compliance. And maybe something came out. Maybe it's, geez, you know, with all of these companies with COVID, it was, well, now we've got to make adjustments to our process because we didn't see that coming. So we will work with the company. It's not like you failed and you, you, you were short three jobs, so the game's over. We're going to decertify your TIF. We're going to work, work them through and understand. And there'll be conversations with the you know, municipality and um, to, if you'd ever get to that point. We often see, honestly, especially on the capital expenditure, it's always it's almost always exceeded, right? Because each year, you, you're now you're in this facility. This is your game plan to get in. This came up. These modifications were needed. These improvements were, were completed. Um, another phase of the project that was done online. The other thing we're talking about with this TIF is, you know, it's 100,000 square feet that this client has taken. It leaves a portion um, of it uh, vacant that they're actively working. You've got a great landlord who's gone ahead and, you know, it's a little like, Build it, they will come. He's already up front started renovating, modernizing the facility. The Hamanetics facility, why that's it vacant? The equipment and the technology is dated. It wasn't ready for the next. It's, these life science companies don't just move in, like, you know, reach all the stores out, reach all the stores in. It, it, it's not so simple um, with the complexities, especially with the clean room build outs. I mean, this is a significant, um, significant project. Okay, well, it's a, a lot to process. Um, I think I'm gonna let my other, my fellow counselors jump in. And if I have more questions, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Uh, other council questions, please. I see that Council Maglio has her hand raised. Yes, I do. Um, thank you very much. This is interesting. And I think Julia, Councilor Flaherty said it well, that this is a lot to process. Um, <clears throat> a couple of questions that I have that due to the nature of this um, being um, the, the, your company, your client not being disclosed to us, some of this I would have probably gathered on my own um, to ask these questions to just sort of get general information, right? So please forgive me if the, my questions are veering off from the TIF just because of the, the, the mystery of it, because I still, I, I'm just not sure of some of these, these aspects and, and how your company is known for doing business. And so I'm just going to ask a few questions along those lines. One of them being in terms of the, um, with the state and the incentives and the um, goals around or the metrics around hiring workers, um, you had mentioned that there, are, there will be contract workers as well as salaried workers. Is, is there a differentiation when that comes to um, reporting that information to the state that there will be in terms of you know certain workforce development goals that these will be positions that are full time that are there for more than nine or 12 months, et cetera? Margaret, do you want to answer that from a state compliance perspective? Yeah, so I think we're looking at, you know, the numbers that they're going to be measuring on are full-time full -time jobs, full-time equivalent okay. jobs. And um, the salary, obviously, the incentives, you're kind of saying, geez, does it make sense to incentivize a lower salary job? No, these are $78,000. That's a, a good salary range. Um, and we're going on head, the full-time headcount is what we're looking for. Great. Great, I, I figured, but I just wanted to ask. Um, so then some of my other questions have to do with sort of the standards of the business. Um, I'm not sure what kind of waste gets um, created at the site at, as a function of the manufacturing. And I'd like to know what kind of impact that might have as well as the waste that gets generated during the build out 
and the um, investment that you're making to um, create um, the, the workable space? Um, will there be any sort of green practices involved um, in the in the construction elements of that? I'll, I'll take a shot at that. Okay, because <laughs> there's, there's a lot to unpack there, but it, that's a great question, Councilor. Thank you for, for posing that. Um, where to start? So let's start first with the waste item. Um, the company is not a large user of water. When you're dealing with life science companies, biotechnology companies specifically, what you find is there is a significant amount of effluent discharge in that water, and that water needs to be either treated on site or put into a municipal water treatment facility, both of which are necessary pretty much bad answers for a community in some cases, because depending on the nature of the operation to make dictate what the level of contaminants within that water is. Um, but from that perspective, obviously it would also be taking up load and space within your municipal water system. Our client in this case is not a significant water user. So from a wastewater perspective, which is generally where the issue is going to be in a life science industry, not a significant issue from our perspective. In addition, if we're talking about construction debris, um, I would also say, point that to the on-site on materials. Typically what you would see, and this would be a discussion with police and fire within the town of Braintree, if there was gonna be any dangerous flammable or other peculiar type of chemical that would be used in the manufacturing process, no, to my knowledge, there has been no permitting that they've been envisioning filing to date other than just standard fire protection permits with the city. So I think that that's something that we can investigate and back you on, but there is nothing that we've been made aware of to this date that I would classify as non-traditional or of significant concern. Um, there obviously are within any manufacturing process, gases and other things that can be used, particularly within the biotech space. If you've ever driven around Cambridge, um, you'll see all the, all the oxygen tanks and other things that are, that are driving around and being delivered to those manufacturing entities. It is part of the process, but it's not something that is risen to a level, I would say, of either a like a bio lab for something that they may be doing on site that could get out to the community or to uh, a, a process that is doing anything that would significantly contaminate or otherwise create an environmental concern for the town. Um, from a building product perspective, it's gonna be fairly standard. I don't think there's anything here that is gonna be outside of the norm. Uh, the clean room environment will is, is largely based upon how rooms are sealed off, treated, and how the air is circulated within them. So when we talk about things that are going to be environmentally friendly, uh, I don't believe that there's any current plan for, let's say, photovoltaics or wind at the site. But what they are sick, always looking at is how can they find more efficient air handling units and things that consume less electricity. So the environmental stewardship on behalf of the company is largely going to be based on process and mechanical efficiency rather than, for example, green power generation. Okay. Um, any, so when you say no, no environmental concern goes against current standards, that Sometimes current standards aren't really so environmentally great. Um, or so I'm not really sure how to understand that. Um, but I'll 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 think about that. Um, where you talk about manufacturing, are there any so are there are there live cultures and things that are in the building? that generates any kind of waste? No, the, the, tissue, the tissue is a synthetic fabrication. So there's no bacterial cultures or, or anything else that are gonna be part of this process. Okay, and this is another thing I would have researched rather than asked at a Ways and Means <sighs> Committee meeting. However, I, do, I am curious, are there animals involved in the no. testing or production? Okay. Um, and in terms of, I understand the idea of building, um, being, being there to recruit more life science. I'm wondering, do you, do you believe that you have the, the potential customer base from this location? Is that where you're talking about being able to look at some of these, the colleges in the area, um, 
and some of the other pockets of life science businesses? I, I think we're, when we're talking about the, the colleges, we're really focusing on more of labor force and customer base. Uh, the company's customer base is global. And there is significant use. If you just think about hospitals and the end users of these products, there is a high concentration of those end users in Massachusetts, surely. Um, an even greater concentration than you think regionally. But this will be the sole United States production facility for this product. We are serving the whole entire US. Where is your R&D or is that, would that give it away? It probably would give it away. Okay. <laughs> it's located out of state. Okay. Um, there, are, there, are a, there are a handful of places in the United States with deep R&D excellence in life sciences. If you picked one of them, you would probably be right. Okay. I think, I think <laughs> we can say it's on the East Coast. Yes. Okay. And, and this will all be, um, we're, we're happy to share all this information specifically with regard to the manufacturing process and some of the permits and the actual specifics about this. Um, we, we hope to, at the next meeting, as this process moves forward, and we have planned to um, have the company's head of manufacturing present to actually walk you through these in, in a finer degree of detail. Excellent. I think um, I think that's that's good for now. I'm going to process that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Council Maglio. I'd like to ask Council Mackin if he had any questions at this time. Um. Thank you, Chairman Reynolds. Uh, no questions. I'll just make a comment. Um, you know, that was a very good presentation. And I apologize you can't see me. I was having problems with my camera. But thank you for joining us tonight. Um, but through the presentation, the questions by the other counselors and the information before, um, I think I know what I need to know right now. Um, I do support this. I'm excited to see you guys coming here. And I would like to give uh, credit to Mayor Kokoros. You know, he's really been doing a big push to get life science here and um it's exciting to see it starting to make headway and you know in addition to make of course his team was helping out as well so uh yeah that's it for me thank you council Mackin. okay i'm just going to ask just a few questions uh i'm the not the extent of my questions uh i'm just looking at the time right now uh i do have to attend another meeting at town hall at seven o'clock I know we have another hearing, um, but I, I guess I would like to just ask a couple of questions. Uh, these can be taken away um, by the uh, experts who are here on the call, along with the uh, uh, with uh, Chief of Staff Tob. So I guess the first is more of a comment and just to share a perspective. You know, um, we understand. Uh, the level of confidentiality and the carefulness uh, due to comp competition in this industry, um, why uh, the confidentiality is being requested here and the way that this is coming forward. Um, however, I'm sure the applicant and certainly the mayor's office understands uh, the need for assurances of the council who act as the authority on how money is spent in this town, or I should say, the authority to approve how money is spent in this town. Um, I do see that this type of a project uh, as a, uh, a business in our community is going to make a significant step towards increasing the badly needed revenues this community uh, has a, a, the position we're in presently. Um, so a few of my questions after that statement is that I ask for your understanding of the position we find ourselves in here. In essence, um, it, from my opinion, it's been a rather short uh, response time we've been provided. Uh, this information has been very helpful. It is painting a picture, but certainly I did not have a, uh, the extent of the picture I did, uh, I did not have prior to this conversation this evening. Um, the um, some of the questions that some of the other counselors have asked, I thought were spot on. Uh, specifics of uh, decertification, for example, I would be curious about. I don't need the answer right now, but if you could take these down, what are the specifics of what triggers decertification? 
Um, I understand that's what decertification would result in. It was explained in some of the memos that we have received already. And just you know, the long and short of it would require uh, the applicant uh, or the TIF recipient to have to start paying a full 100%. Uh, of their tax liability on that property and personal property inside that building. Uh, there was a question that was asked earlier about the performance. How do we track that? I'm interested in the performance schedule, whether that has been established. Um, I understand from a comment from Ms. LaForest that uh, the Office of Business Development monitors uh, the performance of these TIFs. Uh, I would be interested in that schedule of monitoring and reporting out to host communities uh, and also what uh, that they are on track from a performance standpoint and a milestone standpoint. Um, I'd be interested in a schedule of the fit up when it would be completed, what the full staffing, when that would be in place. I would also be interested, is there any kind of mitigation steps that have been factored in uh, from the manufacturing uh, company, having been involved in uh, businesses that have relocated from one part of the country to the other, and that sometimes you do have attrition of those already established employees that will not go along with the move. Um, however, that's less of a concern at this particular point based on my understanding and certainly familiarization with the level of education, a, a ready workforce in this area where obviously what has drawn this applicant to Braintree into the Boston area. Uh, let's see, what else do I have here? Um, there are some questions that I look forward to have being answered that were supplied earlier. In a letter to the mayor's office, I'd like to understand uh, the plan to get this approved with the state or more specifically, I think Ms. LaForest would be able to provide with us what is that timeline? What kind of factor does that have on why we're being asked to have this approved by April 5th? Um, again, that goes to my concern of the short uh, ramp that we've been provided to understand, to get comfortable and to uh, move this process along. Uh, and I would also be very interested in uh, how does the TIF factor into the long-term plan for the firm's uh, economic growth and perhaps expansion in Braintree uh, after 15 years. And naturally there'll be market forces, there'll be competition. There's the, there's the likelihood of success of this company being pursued perhaps uh, in a success story of being bought out by somebody else. These are all just you know, natural occurrences in the marketplace. So these are just a little bit of an understanding and I know that uh, due to uh, confidentiality purposes that perhaps you cannot spell out or fully articulate uh, a kind of answer that you normally would provide. Okay, I understand that. So. Um, so with that, uh, I am, I think for purposes of time that I would take a motion for us to continue this to the 28th, which is this coming Tuesday, we have you on that schedule ways and means, uh, as I said, we've made some good progress here this evening and I'm very excited about that. Um, and I'm looking forward very much. But before I go, I do know, I think, Margaret, you're asking for a, another comment. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just very quickly can answer three of your questions. Decertification, the performance well, no, schedule, Margaret, and so, timeline. Yes, I appreciate very that. Uh, you could provide that information again just for the sake of time. We're getting very tight here. Yeah, annual performance schedule. And the timeline is it'll be on EACC June 16th. I'm we, Chairman we Reynolds, if, if, I, if I may, uh, Mr. Chair, understanding that the committee is short for time this evening, um, we, you know, I've taken note of the questions. A lot of them uh, are readily answerable 
that's the right uh, terminology through the draft agreement, which as I indicated, we'll be providing uh, hopefully in advance of the next meeting, as well as being able to provide next week the identity of the client, which I think will also help to answer some of the questions. I do appreciate the added layer of difficulty that that may uh, provide to this process. Uh, but I do just want to thank the committee for their time and thoughtful questions. I also just want to note, I think everybody received the message. Uh, Margaret has graciously offered her, her time and her expertise. If any member of this committee or the full council has any specific questions about this, the TIF process and this TIF in particular and the impacts, I would encourage, I've learned a lot from Margaret in this process. I would encourage folks to take advantage of that uh, resource that has been made available to us I think everybody has her contact information, but if not, you know, please let me know. Again, looking forward to continuing this discussion next week uh, with the committee and further answering any questions that you might have. Thank you, uh, Chief of Staff Todd. I appreciate that. And thank you, Ms. LaForest, for your uh, answer uh, on the state um, process for approval as far as the expected timelines. Um, okay. So any additional comment before we close or take a motion to continue the hearing from the council or committee members? Oh. Motion to oh. table order 22017 to a future Ways and Means meeting, um, 32922 at 5.30 p.m. I have a motion. Do we have a second? I believe that was a second from Council mm -hmm. Maglio. Okay, uh, Clerk Samino, if you would take the roll call, please. Council Reynolds. Aye. Council Flaherty. Aye. Council Mackin. Aye. Council Maglio. Four in favor, zero opposed. Okay, it's unanimous. We will continue this uh, till the 28th of March, and I believe that time frame. Um, seven, six thirty. Uh, Sue, so I don't have the agenda in front of me. Five thirty on the 29th. Five thirty on the 29th, and we will be on Zoom once more. Yes. Very good. Well, I want to thank you, folks, uh, all of you, uh, Miss LaForest, Mr. Pyers, and Mr. Nerlich. If I is that the pronounce, correct pronunciation, Nerlich? Close enough. Thank you. Okay, my apologies. Okay, well, thank you very much. And I hope you have a good evening. Look forward to talking to you again on Tuesday. Thank you all. Thank you. All. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so we'll move on to the last item on our agenda. That being authorization uh, 22018 authorization to accept donations or take up any action relative there too. And I'll turn that over to Chief of Staff Todd. Thank you, uh, Chairman Reynolds. Let me just flip to my notes there. So that item before you this evening is a very generous donation from the Braintree Art Association in the amount of $20,000 uh, to set up a scholarship fund that will be administered uh, with $1,000 a year to help support a Braintree art student going to college. This was brought forward to us by Terry Gorman, who is the Art Association's director and treasurer. And I believe the committee was provided in the memo a little bit of history about the Braintree Art Association, which existed uh, dating back, has existed dating back to 1960. Uh, and contributes to the community through various art shows, monthly demos at the library, and then one culminating show at the Thayer Academy. Um, really looking to encourage ways to explore uh, people's talent through art uh, by establishing the scholarship, recognizing a Braintree High School senior who will be pursuing a degree in the field of art. Uh, the association hopes to continue its support and inspiration of our young artists. And so with that, we would be looking for the uh, committee and then the full council's authorization to accept this donation so that we can uh, establish the scholarship fund and uh, begin to administer it to our high school seniors. Thank you. Do we have questions from the council, from the Ways and Means Committee? Pardon me, I think uh, Councilor Flaherty. Was there a question? Um, no, I was just interrupted, but I will say, I will take the opportunity 
opportunity to say, I think it's wonderful that this is uh, being considered and I'm certainly happy to support it. Thank you. Any other comments from, I, I don't, I think there is none coming from Council Magler with a shake of her head. <laughs> Very good. Council Mackin, any questions, concerns? Uh, no, there's not. Thank you. Okay, I too agree. Uh, this is a great opportunity uh, to further promote art uh, in our community. Um, I know that uh, the Braintree Art Association uh, had been established for a number of years here in Braintree, going back, I'm going to say at least 30, 40 years. Um, and unfortunately, uh, that group is breaking up. And as part of that, they've graciously offered uh, to uh, disperse some of their assets towards Braintree for this great uh, opportunity for our young folks um, to pursue uh, education in the arts. So I will be fully supporting this as a recommended approval to the full council. So that being said, I would ask uh, Clerk Semino, or excuse me, I stand corrected. I would ask for a motion from the Ways and Means Committee membership. Um, for favorable recommendation to the full council motion that the town of Braintree be and hereby is authorized in accordance with section 53A of chapter 44 of the Massachusetts general laws to accept the following gift upon the conditions attached and herein set forth Braintree Art Association $20,000 for the purpose of an art scholarship. Thank you. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Councillor Mackin. Uh, Clerk Samino, if you'd please take a roll call for the vote. Councillor Reynolds. Aye. Councillor Flaherty. Aye. Councillor Mackin. Aye. Councillor Maglio. Aye. Four in favor, zero opposed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that is a four, uh, you're welcome. Um, <coughs> unanimous vote in favor of a favorable recommendation to the full council. Thank you very much. Um, so do we have a motion for adjournment? So moved. All right, we have the motion from Councilor Flaherty. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second from Councilor uh, Maglio and Con uh, Clerk Samino, if you please roll call the vote. Councilor Reynolds. Aye. Councilor Flaherty? Aye. Councilor Mackin? Aye. Councilor Maglio? Aye. All in favor to adjourn. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope you have a good evening. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks, good night, guys. everybody. Thank All you. Bye-bye. Right.